alumni uh, association, regional alumni clubs, and shared interest groups. Thank you for joining Cali over the five weeks. Don't miss the closing session this Saturday at 10 a.m. with the special speakers, the Honorable Madeline Albright, 68 GSAS, 76 GSAS, 95, 95 Honorable former U.S. Secretary of State, Lee C. Bollinger, 71 Law, President Columbia University, and Lisa Carnoy, 89CC University Trustee, Chief Financial Officer, Alex Partners. We will also host three additional bon bonus Cali Trivia Nights on Thursday, November 12th at 8 p.m. Singapore time, 7 a.m. EST by Columbia Alumni Association Singapore, Saturday, November 21 at 4 p.m. GMT, London time, 11 a.m. EST by Columbia University Club of London and at 5 p.m. EST by Columbia SoCo and CAA Boston. I am excited to introduce the presenters for this session. Peter Match, 95CC, a board member of the Columbia Alumni Association of Vietnam, and Ivan Leniski, 16CC, the fi financial chair of the Latino Alumni Association of Columbia University, who are eager to share this, their insights with you. Mr. Match is a 1995 graduate of Columbia College and a 1996 graduate of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. We worked in finance, he worked in finance, sorry, as an executive director of Goldman Sachs in New York and Hong Kong between 1996 and 2002, and as a managing director at Credit Suisse in Hong Kong between 2002 and 2007. In 2007, Peter left Wall Street to co-found Petbridge Capital, a fund management company that specialized in investing in equities and real estate development projects in Vietnam. In 2011, Peter joined the hedge funds HBH Capital Advisors in Singapore as a partner, specializing in M&A and investing with event-driven strategies. In 2012, Peter founded a non-profit educational organization called AMA Vietnam LTD in Singapore, helping underprivileged students and teachers of his home country, Vietnam, with scholarships. Peter subsequently also established a family office to invest across equities, fixed income, hedge funds, and real estate globally. In 2014, he co-founded co Tanzani International Limited, which invests and develops luxury resorts and residential properties in Vietnam. Ivan Leninsky, 16CC, is the finance chair of Latino Alumni Association of Columbia University. Ivan holds a BA in political science from Columbia College and is currently an MBA student at Harvard Business School. Prior to HBS, he worked as an investment banking associate on the student loan finance and housing finance teams at RBC Capital Markets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, and again, thank you all for joining. Good morning, good evening. My name is Mia Wright. I'm the Director of Global Engagement for the CAA. And I'm so thankful to see so many people joining us this morning. Uh, it's been quite a journey, five weeks, and we're on our final week. And uh, the staff and I can't be more thankful for all of the supports our, our leaders have uh, shown us throughout this time. And uh, 
we would love uh, to start this conversation. Um, I'm going to start with Ivan and uh, would love to know about your journey, um, your personal CA leadership journey. Uh, hey, uh, hope everyone's having a, a good morning or wherever, uh, wherever you are, what time it is. Uh, my, my route um, was, I guess, a slow, natural process. Um, so, for example, the LACU, um, LACU sent an email, must have been 2017, so right after I graduated, pretty much just asking um, for people to nominate themselves for board positions. Um, LACU had gone, in my opinion, a little bit, uh, a little bit downwards in engagement, um, and they had some open board positions. Um, so it was pretty much an open call to their entire listserv. Um, and I pretty much just raised my hand. I sent in uh, a little blurb about myself, um, frankly, thinking that there was no way that someone, you know, six months after school was going to be uh, potentially the finance chair of LACU, but I, I sent it in um, and I was selected, which was great. Um, there was a small um, election. Uh, I was the only person nominated. So... <laughs> That was an easy election to win, um, but then once once I got involved with like Coup, it just it ended it kept kind of spiraling from there, if you will. Um, so I I got on the board of the Columbia College Young Alumni, um, which was also a lot of fun. Just you know being with alumni of my own age, um, Columbia College Young Alumni is um, just for Columbia College graduates within the first ten years of graduation, um, and then. You know, once I, I feel once I was in the um, kind of Columbia College volunteer ether, um, then, you know, staff kind of just started reaching out for different positions. So, for example, the Columbia College Alumni Association Board has an ex officio spot um, for a LACU kind of representative so that a, a Latino voice from LACU is on the board of Columbia College. And I was kind of nominated for that position. So now I go to um, uh, Columbia College alumni uh, board meetings as a non-voting member, but it's great to just kind of be on the board and like listen and, and hear, you know, from the Columbia College Dean, uh, Dean Valentini about, you know, different, um, you know, positions and different um, initiatives that they're doing. Um, and you kind of just kind of slowly get Kind of roped into the the governance process, um, if you will, of of Columbia College and or, and you know Columbia in general, um, and you just learn more and more. Um, then, for example, the I'm now on the fifth year uh, fifth year reunion committee for uh, so I guess now cl twenty class of twenty sixteen. So for twenty twenty one, and that's been great. So I'm on the finance committee. Um, they reached out asking you know for volunteers for a bunch of different uh positions i decided to do finance uh because that's what i know um and and it was great because you know then you kind of meet a bunch of your classmates and even new classmates that um that you know maybe while you were at columbia you didn't really talk to uh, just because you were in different social circles so it, it's been great um just kind of slowly building out um my Columbia College volunteering career, if you will. Um, oh, but it, you know, this process was over four years. Um, to be totally frank, now while at HBS, it's 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 getting a little harder um, to be involved, just because now I'm in Boston instead of New York, um, which I guess doesn't matter as much during um, COVID times. But um, it's definitely you know it's becoming a little bit more difficult from a time perspective. But that's the beauty of volunteering, right? So you can. You can, you, you can turn it on and off um, or kind of throttle it back um, as, as required um, based off your kind of own personal time. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely been a, it's, it's been a slow process, but it's been great. I mean, you know, sometimes it feels a, a little worky or a little grindy, um, you know, when you're working with a, a staff member going through the Excel, seeing who 
who's donated and who hasn't. But then other times it's obviously, you know, a blast where you're going to like galas and dinners and, and uh, meeting new people and interesting people and just having cool conversations. So um, it's, uh, it's been great. Thank you so much, Ivan. Peter, what has your experience been? What's your CAA journey? Uh, well, thank you for having me today, firstly. Uh, so let me break my story uh, in terms of just uh, alumni leadership story into two parts. Uh, the par first part will be in Singapore and the second part will be uh, in Vietnam. Uh, so about six years ago, uh, well, Previously, I was living in Hong Kong for 10 years, and as a young alumni in my 20s and early 30s, then, I was hardly active as a participant and definitely not a leader in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, I hardly attended any event just because you're busy with your life and your career and your young family. Uh, but six years ago, I became a, a, a relatively more active participant and, and subsequently alumni leader through uh, someone you all may know named Mary, Mary Kuo. Uh, so Mary Kuo was the new president of the Singapore Alumni Club at the time, and she recruited me to be her VP and really took me under her wings. Um, and um, I, I learned a lot uh, very quickly. And the mission uh, that we uh, drew up together was really to grow the club. Uh, so we renew the demographics of a club to understand the diversity of our members in terms of age, uh, gender and interests and so on. And then we really drew up plans, get organized and recruited young alumni to uh, uh, and empower them ver uh, uh, through various committees and subcommittees to really address the interests uh, of, our, our, of our members. And, uh, you know, I think usually the success of a club has a lot to do with creative programming and how you bring the community together uh, through interesting events across the spectrum. Uh, so I think uh, over time, uh, Mary was an amazing leader and taught me a tremendous amount. Uh, so in hindsight, I think when I look back today, uh, Mary really did handpick me and grew me for future leadership. Uh, so let me move on to my uh, uh, second part of the story, which is uh, when I moved me, uh, myself and my family, uh, my wife and three kids to, to Ho Chi Minh City here in Vietnam um, three years ago. And I think right away I was already an excited uh, uh, alumni leader and, and, and a new alumnus in, in the scene in Vietnam. Uh, and I, so I contacted the, the leaders here, Olivia and Michael at CA Ho Chi Minh City, and really just think about how I can help the club. Uh, and eventually, basically, I hosted an event uh, on behalf of a visiting professor from the East Asian Institute, uh, uh, namely Professor Hung, as well as the president of Fulbright University of Vietnam, which is a new university set up by uh, a joint venture between the Vietnamese government and, and the US government. And uh, you know, through that event, I met a lot of other alums, uh, uh, met some professors and met the two leaders of the two university. And you know, interestingly, subsequently, I follow up with both, stay in touch with both. And even when I was at alumni weekend last year in New York City, uh, you know, I basically went to see Professor Hung uh, uh, in person and then met, went to see the, the, the head of the East Asian Institute to see you know, uh, what more we can do together to really address the, uh, advance the interests of Columbia in Vietnam together with Fulbright University. So I think through that event, just by being more involved, uh, it opened up new opportunities for me to explore, uh, to really help the club and, and to help the greater uh, uh, interests of the university. Um, now, I'll tell you another interesting story, which is uh, during COVID time, uh, there was a uh, uh, senior uh, uh, from Columbia College uh, named Daisy Vo, and she's sort of my quote unquote mentee. And she approached me to be a speaker uh, uh, addressing uh, basically how to find a job during COVID period. And I took a look, I agreed to speak and I took a look at her agenda and I decided, you know, Daisy, why don't I help you with identifying more relevant speakers in Vietnam? Uh, why don't we uh, revise the content uh, to, to address more relevant issues? And uh, so we really partner up as a kind of a mentor-mentee relationship. Uh, and I think she excelled uh, in, in terms of marketing and distribution. Uh, so in, in a matter of like one, two weeks, we put together a great program. We had 130 attendees. We work with the leaders of various uh, uh, Ivy League universities here in Saigon. So we had a big audience, a very successful event. And it just goes to show that I think if, if you have good content, 
good marketing strategies, in particular nowadays, digital marketing strategies, you can really draw a crowd and you can really, I think, create uh, a lot of unity with other schools and students from uh, alums from other universities as well. So for a small country like Vietnam is highly relevant. Uh, we don't have like a hundred or a thousand members like we do in other countries. So it's great collaboration with other universities. And I was very excited. Um, now, I think right now my, my new mission uh, as uh, an alum is really to see what I can do to help the club, uh, the CAA Vietnam, working with Olivier and Michael and other leaders in Vietnam. Uh, and I basically draw on my experience that I learned from Mary, which is I think to start top down, to identify, I think our, to understand our demographics uh, and, and to really then understand the challenges that we face uh, in, in taking the club, I think, into the next five years of growth. So, for example, you know, I think similar to the experience I learned in Hong Kong is, you know, we have to understand that we have older alums and younger alums, and, 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 and we have grads and undergrads. We, particularly in a country like Vietnam, we have a long uh, country just like Italy. We have the north and the south. We have people who are in public sector, you know, those I went to school with, mainly government officials, various ministers who are public officials, who have public and private, you know, people who are really in the private sector. And then of course, we have foreign and local. Uh, so most of these government officials, when I went to school with them at SEAT, but they hardly speak English. Uh, you know, they were learning English and learn, learning coursework at the same time. And they're back in Vietnam in very high positions in Hanoi. And I'm, I'm down here in Ho Chi Minh City, it's a two hour flight. But it's a very big and interesting and diverse Columbia community across the public and private sector. And we need to understand who they are, where they are, and how we can really unify the interests and bring the club together as one family. Um, so I think uh, that that's gonna be a challenge in terms of just understanding the demographics, breaking it down and, and see how we can come up with uh, a, a set of common interests and common agenda so that we can grow the club over time. Uh, so I think in terms of diversity inclusion, uh, it's very important uh, to have that reflected in the leadership in terms of the events that we, we create and, and promote. Um, and and uh, I, I think similarly, it's also very important that uh, as a leadership team that we delegate very well, that we bring in young alums to address young alum issues uh, while we have other alums to address a, a more diverse community. Uh, so I think uh, my experience has been very positive, both in Singapore and Vietnam, and I look forward to growing the club here together with the other leaders here. Uh, so one thing that just came up, for example, uh, just the other day is, uh, I, you know, I was hold, hosting a few um, uh, consul generates from a few European countries, including the USA. And, and afterwards, uh, you know, I just thought of an idea that I can do on behalf of, uh, of the com community here for Colombia. Uh, you, you know, which is, hey, why don't we uh, host a post-U.S. election party and invite, uh, uh, you know, our, our alums uh, to have, you know, food and wine and, and talk about the election, talk a little bit about politics, celebrate Biden's victory, celebrate a new beginning for the U.S., but at the same time, you know, have the consul, uh, consul, gener uh, 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 consul general from the U.S.A. named Marie to be there and make it more interesting to answer questions about the implications of a Biden victory for Vietnam and, and for other countries in Asia. So my point in bringing this up is that I think when uh, you wanna promote the club, it's good to think about uh, relevant content, timely delivery uh, to really draw a nice crowd and then to think about, okay, how you do distribution. Uh, I, I think that's when you really address a common set of interests uh, and grow the club, uh, I think, in, in more interesting ways. Um, so that's all I have to share for now, and I'll share more in the second part. Thank you so much, Peter. That was great. So um, my next topic is, uh, I'd like to start off with you, Ivan, uh, discussing some of what you think the insights on effective leadership is for you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about luck too, because that's definitely um, where most of my time is, um, you know, spent from a Columbia leadership position, uh, perspective. And, you know, I, I definitely don't have all the answers, but 
you know, I feel like Laku has grown a lot in the last four years and, um, you know, pretty much from all metrics, right? I mean, our events, we're getting more people involved. Um, our Laku fund um, has quadrupled and, you know, or tripled in donations. Um, so it, it's definitely been a, a good run for the last, you know, kind of three, four years, I would say. Um, kind of main things I would say is, diversity and inclusion, right? And, and I mean that in all, um, you know, every perspective possible. Um, so for example, kind of age, right? So I'm definitely the youngest person on the board and I think I bring a, you know, a, a different perspective, um, you know, to older board members from like, oh, like what events should we throw? Or, you know, what, um, um, what events do I think people might, um, you know, find interesting, for example. Um, but then also you obviously need older boards, uh, board members, cause you know, they give more money and stuff like that. So, uh, like, uh, you definitely need kind of a, a wide variety of age. I think, um, you know, we have a, a good variety of schools. Um, so, uh, Laku is, you know, all of Columbia. Um, so every, every school is, is supposed to be represented. And, you know, I went to Columbia College, our president went to SEPA. Um, we have people from C's. Um, so we definitely have a good variety of schools, for example. So um, it allows, um, you know, different board members to reach out to, you know, different respective leadership um, at their respective schools when we're trying to throw events um, or try to raise money. Um, so I think, you know, or, or push whatever initiative we're trying to push, right? So uh, having a diverse, you know, set of schools, right? I think um, as a Columbia College alum, it can sometimes get, uh, be easy to be a little Columbia College centric, for example. Um, the other is, you know, I, as a Columbia, as a, as a club, we, there's a dual mission, right? I mean, one of it is to create a vibrant alumni community. And the second one is to obviously raise money, right? So with that in mind, you really need to make sure that you're creating a value add to your kind of client base, which is obviously the alumni, right? So for example, during COVID, we've been throwing um, Zoom events, right? Not you don't want to go overboard because I think everyone's a, a little Zoom fatigued, but also, you know, being able to think of fun, cool events. So, for example, we had a we had a yoga event, right? Um, you know, it's or, or a good mix of kind of maybe more academic, maybe a little bit of networking and then some that are more fun. Like a, we had a wine tasting, for example. Um, so uh, definitely having a good variety. And that's also where the diversity and inclusion comes, right? Where different board members can have different ideas about events. Um, so definitely making sure that the community is strong. I think where we need to have more work is um, getting some of the schools that are maybe a little bit less core to Columbia. So for example, we have no one from the dentistry school. We don't really have anyone from the medical school. Um, so getting some of the, especially some of the grad schools more involved, um, I think geographic diversity is a issue for us. Um, so our, our club's a little New York centric. So we're trying to, for example, throw more events in San Francisco and have, um, board members in San Francisco, um, which is kind of another big hub of, uh, Latino alumni. So we're definitely trying to work on that. Um, what else have we been doing? Um, I, I guess we're also trying to ex potentially expound to, uh, expand to LA. Um, so I, I guess is the main thing is just thinking of your the diverse um, alumni um, set. And I guess the as the finance chair, I'm always thinking about donor dollars. It, it really helps drive donations, right? So it's like if if you're having events. If you're if you're creating a vibrant community, then donations obviously come um, quickly. 
right? And, and much easier. You don't want to be the, the, the only time they hear from you is Columbia, you know, Columbia Giving Day, right? So it, it, it definitely helps the donation. So, right, so if you, if you create the strong community, um, the donations is kind of an afterthought at that point. So that's kind of the main thing. It's, diversity and inclusion, I think, is the main, uh, the main theme of great leadership. Thank you so much, Ivan. I go to you, Peter. Uh, I think on this topic of uh, e effective leadership, uh, I, I would have four points to share. Uh, whether you are a contributing uh, alumni leader or um, the president or vice president of a club uh, leading all the other members, I think the first effective strategy is really to understand demographics, like I said earlier, is to study demand and supply. I think where I have seen events gone wrong or clubs gone wrong is when the strategies are very supply driven, meaning you don't really know what your members want, what your customers want, and you're just jamming stuff down your, your uh, other people's throat based on your own desires. And I think that's when events are not successful. So I think my advice is, from my own experience, is that I think you really know, need to know what members want based on the demographics of your own club in your own country. Every country has its own unique set of challenges and issues, and you need to understand what they are. And, and be creative and be entrepreneurial in how you resolve those issues uh, for your members. So in general, I would say demand-driven strategies work best. It is about the members. You know, younger alums tend to be more career-focused. Older alums, uh, you know, with let's say high school kids, uh, you know, tend to, to, you know, tend to be more college-focused for the kids. So they're more interested in, in, you know, getting more, some of those benefits from, from the club. Um, so that's first first point, just to understand the uh, supply and demand, and, and be demand uh, uh, driven as a strategy. My second point is that you know strong leadership is really really important. At the same time, if you're strong and good leader, you also need to know how to delegate, how to decentralize, and how to empower uh, others around you. So similar to what I said earlier about Mary Core's strategy, uh, when I worked with her, was that you know she really selected the right people. Uh, to make the club younger, to involve them in, in uh, programming, uh, in making uh, 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 interesting programs for all types of alums in our club. Uh, and, and what does it mean to select young people? I really, I think it comes down to uh, really handpicking doers, you know, people who are really interested in the club, interested in serving the community uh, and, and uh, playing uh, a role uh, in, in that process. Uh, so secondly, is that I think, you know, these people end up basically organizing with a lot of thought um, and, and basically with, with responsibility delegated to them. Uh, so I think leadership matters. Delegation really matters in, in running a club well. Uh, my third point is that I think is important to stay connected uh, with your mothership. And that mothership can be a, uh, the other regional club. So in my case, I'm sitting here in Vietnam, but I try to stay in touch uh, uh, with Singapore that I used to be a part of, uh, but also being aware of what the other clubs are doing in the region. China is super impressive and I'm on the chat group with them on WeChat. And I learned so much just from reading the chats in terms of interesting events, how they run it, how they market it. Uh, so I think it's good to learn from other clubs uh, that are around you, uh, that are comparables. Uh, you know, so some clubs in other countries may not be applicable to Vietnam, but other clubs uh, within Asia, within other regions may be applicable. So I think the more you know, the better. Uh, so in my case, uh, you know, New York City is also important to me. As I said earlier, in terms of working with Fulbright and the East Asian Institute, had I not gone to New York, I don't think I would have uh, been able to really to spot an opportunity to advance the interests of Columbia uh, with the East Asian Institute together with Fulbright University of, of Vietnam, you know, where we're working on to, to build a Columbia Center, hopefully over time. Um, my last point is, is really, I think, important to have vision, to invest in that vision, to invest in the future of your club. Uh, you know, I think it starts with, um, uh, you know, obviously having a strategy, but also group the grooming and mentoring young leaders, the way that Mary groomed me, the way that I'm advising some of the Colum uh, younger Columbia alums right now. 
you know, Vietnam is very interesting, right? We, we have one of the youngest populations in the world. 65% uh, of our population is, is younger than the age of 35 years of age. Uh, so most of our alums tend to be older. Now, the newer members are completely the millennials. You know, they, these are sort of 18 to, I would say 24, 25 at best. So we really have, um, you know, basically a, a, a quite extreme of a population in terms of uh, older alums and, and very young alums. Uh, but I think it's good to invest in these young alums while addressing the needs of the older alums in the country. Uh, so I would really advise on, on picking the right people and investing in the right people to grow the club. Uh, and I think it's important, uh, like Ivan said earlier, to really have great programs to engage alums and excite your members and, and you know, with fun and meaningful activities. Uh, so I think that takes a little bit of sort of entrepreneurship. Uh, you really have to think about what products you're selling through the events effectively based on the demand that you see and how you do marketing. And nowadays, you know, digital marketing is so important. So you need to have young alums who can help you with smart digital marketing in order to draw the crowd. Uh, and I think my last point is really um, to celebrate uh, each other's achievements in the club and to promote pride for the school and also for your club. You know, I, I'm very proud of what Mary has done uh, in, in Singapore and I've learned a lot from that. And, you know, she generated a lot of pride for all the alums in Singapore. It grew tremendously and successfully. And also, I think every, we're all very proud of the club at the same time as being members of the club. So I think I hope to work with the leadership in Vietnam and do the same as Mary has done for, for Singapore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And um, what stands out, what you say about, you know, one person, Mary's influence has has carried over into other clubs. So I think it's, it's really valuable that, you know, every leader uh, impact is, it can be much larger than just them within their club. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I believe we had one comment or question, um, Jose from uh, Dallas. Uh, I, do you wanna, what was your question to the, to the group? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mia. So, um, you know, I posed this question because it's um, uh, a big challenge. Uh, you know, I attended my first leadership weekend uh, a couple of years ago, and in, uh, in fact, last year. Um, and uh, one of the most profound presentations that I had the privilege to attend uh, talked about the concept of uh, the difference between purpose, mission, vision, and values. And that for an organization to last, it has to have some sort of purpose. But then how does that purpose um, align with a mission, which is slightly different, uh, and the vision uh, and values that come in the execution? So, uh, you know, this is kind of the bridging the gap between the conceptual and the actual. Um, and, and I think it's relevant to the conversation that we're having this morning because we're talking about a sustainable organization. Uh, well, one of the key, uh, the, the key points about, well, not sustainable, but you know, about uh, engendering uh, ongoing leadership and cultivating leadership. So in order to attract people like Peter was talking about, um, you know, and, uh, and, and that Ivan was talking about, um, you know, there, there needs to be more of a comprehensive statement about what the club it really is, um, you know, and uh, that people will get behind it and support it. Um, so my question is, how do you actually uh, formulate that? Uh, how do you uh, <clears throat> communicate that to potential servant leaders uh, as, as they, you know, uh, the future uh, it is considered? Um, and, and how do you mentor that? Uh, in those volunteers that will become future servant leaders. That's great. Peter, Ivan, either one of you want to comment? I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, this, I mean, I feel like this is really hard. I mean, I, the what we're thinking about doing is having more committees. Um, 
So for example, I don't really have like an heir apparent of like who would be the next finance chair. Um, and I think the main thing would be to try and build committees um, to, because I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think having some kind of mission statement or right, like that's not how you necessarily like pass down, um, you know, this is our mission, like read this and now you know our mission kind of thing. It's, it's, it's more about having people involved. Now, the issue with kind of a volunteer organization, obviously, is that people come and go uh, sometimes kind of willy nilly. And there's more like, like who has a, a very strong core of call it six, seven volunteers that have been kind of through its, you know, through thick and thin. And then there's kind of other volunteers that are kind of more kind of in the in the sideline. And those are great, obviously, you, you need every type of volunteer, but then it definitely makes it difficult from like a succession standpoint. Um, so I guess I don't really have an answer, but I, 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 the main thing I think is to just, it's, it's more about just having people be involved. And then, you know, I think people will kind of step up to the plate, um, you know, who's been around for a year or two and it's still enjoying it um, will be the, the leader of the future, right? But it, it's definitely very difficult. Peter, you have any comments? Yeah, I actually just pull up the notes to understand the question. So, uh, okay, let me let me try to make sure I understand the question and, and give you the, uh, my thoughts. Um, I think the mission of the club is to stay relevant to its members. And, and as a general statement, but I think it's very true, uh, which in, in, I think in any country, uh, uh, every country members are different. Uh, the issues uh, in that country are different or that region are different. And I think as a club leader, as an alumni leader, even as a member, I think you need to um, highlight what those, what those issues are. What, what, what is relevant to you? How can the club serve you? Or if you're a leader, how do you make yourself relevant to your club members to, to stay in business really, right? Uh, to be sustainable. So like I said, that, that's what I call demand-driven demand strategies. Uh, and, and that can change in time uh, based on people's interests. It can change based on uh, demographics. They're, they're, they're new coming into your club. And, and I think you really need to think of a club in, in somewhat of a business uh, so, so that you know you you stay relevant and and sustainable that way. Um, I mean, I, I'm just reading questions about uh, is it the club leaders who spot and breed future leaders, or is this the job spread amongst committee members? I think it's all about teamwork. Um, you know, I think what we did in Singapore was great, which is uh, we meet a lot. Uh, the 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 team was actually quite big in terms of. Uh, you know, president and vice president and treasurer and secretary, and then the committees and some subcommittees, uh, you know, we were very good in identifying uh, the, you know, what each person has to offer and how we pull it together and how we create programs uh, that address wider interests. Uh, so some things are just too young for me. I, I'm not interested. I, I wouldn't even think about it, but some young, younger members in the table during that discussion of eight to 10 people, other committee members would come up with, you know, ideas from the left field and they're relevant. They're relevant to some of the other members. And I would not have thought of them. I think it's important to have that diversity expressed on the table when you have any discussion, these discussions. Um, so I, I think you always just have to, to stay relevant that way to make sure that you have a little paranoia about you know, what am I missing? You know, am I really addressing all the members of, of the community? And if not, how do I, uh, how do I address that issue? Who can help me within this club amongst the members? And really, I think, uh, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with those members of your club that you think can add value uh, and, and, and invite them to head a committee, uh, to uh, champion a, a, a certain event. Uh, so I think that that's uh, great teamwork uh, it keeps your club relevant and interesting and always, I think, rejuvenating. 
so I think you just constantly have to recreate yourself just like a business uh, to stay relevant. Mia, if I may. Of course. Um, uh, I may have uh, conflated several questions. <laughs> uh, and, and so I apologize if my question was confusing. Um, the, uh, let me illustrate by saying that in Dallas-Fort Worth uh, here in Texas, we have um, about a thousand people moving into the Metroplex on a daily basis. We have over 2,500 Columbia alumni uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area alone and thousands in Texas in general. One of the challenges in a, in a fast growing area where there's a large infusion of people from elsewhere um, is that quite there's a quite a bit of diversity, which is awesome. Um, it wasn't here, it wasn't that way in Dallas 30, 35 years ago when I first visited, um, or not so much as today. So what we've done here is chosen to focus, for example, on the purpose of the, uh, the club to uh, create a platform to unite lions that are in the DFW area, uh, a mission to serve those who are inbound to become familiarized with the area and to find fellowship with other lions that are here so that they feel welcomed. Uh, and that uh, we go on to create a vision for how we do that in execution by creating events that are more socially oriented, but also intellectually stimulating like trivia nights and things like that, not just bar hopping. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, this, this kind of, um, uh, this is just an example. I wanted to, want to know how other people do that, uh, but then also pass that along as, um, you know, the mission and values to uh, the future leadership. And I, I think I got the answer that I was looking for. I, I apologize that the question wasn't very well formed. Thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you yeah. so much. I, I guess the, the main yeah, I'll, thing- I'll share maybe- No, you go, you go, Peter. I know. Go ahead, Ivan. Go ahead. I, I, the, um, no, that's, that's definitely a, a difficult uh, situation. I think the main thing is you don't need to have, not every event needs to be um, great for everyone. So having tailoring, tailoring events for certain demographics is totally fine. So um, if you want to make, um, you know, a public sector event, or, you know, you want to make a, a young people event, right? So it's like, you know, young people like to, young people like to drink, or like young people like to, uh, um, you know, may, maybe meet with other young alums, right? So maybe you have a, you know, a young alumni uh, whiskey tasting night or something, right? Like this type of stuff, um, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, students or, or recent alums are moving to Dallas, they don't have many friends, and, and, it, and it's a great way to kind of meet new friends kind of thing. But then, you know, older alum, you know, they don't need, you know, they have their social network. And, you know, they're just trying to uh, maybe make uh, more kind of professional uh, connections or something like that. So maybe you kind of have a, a more, um, you know, black tie networking event or something like that. So I, I think the, the main thing is it's okay to tailor events for certain demographics because, you know, demographics are different, obviously. <laughs> Peter, did you want to comment? Um, yeah, I, I guess, um... I'm looking at all the questions on the right and, and just something came into my mind, which is um, uh, going, I think it's a similar point, which is about, you know, your value add and um, uh, being creative in the country and the club that uh, the environment that you operate in. Um, I mean, I can just think of an example here in Vietnam. Uh, like I said, we have very, uh, a big economy of, older alums and very young alums. So even those who are still 
studying at Columbia, when I, when I was on campus at Columbia, I would visit, you know, four or five Vietnamese students from Vietnam, not the Vietnamese students who are in, uh, who, who are from the US or other parts, but from Vietnam. And I think it's important that you do that because their parents appreciate it. So one thing that comes out of a smaller club like Vietnam is that we, I'm actually trying to engage parents, uh, you know, because the parents want you to be a mentor to their kids. You know, how do they, you know, on, on their career, uh, on, on various issues that come up. Um, and, and I think it's good to get involved even when they're in college, if you can, uh, or just after they graduate now because of COVID, a lot of these students are coming back is how do we help them uh, through mentoring, th through job placements, through internships. You know, I just took on a, a, uh, a student who is about to go to Columbia for graduate school uh, as, as an intern for my company. And I think that's what I mean by investing, you know, whether it's through mentoring students that you, you, you run into, or if you know their, get to know their parents, uh, invest in that relationship with their parents, uh, because their parents also, I think over time, whether the students or the parents, uh, like I said, they may also donate to, to the school. It may not be immediately, it could be five years to 10 years from now, but I think you need to invest in those relationships. And, and every uh, uh, committee member or alumni leader of the club uh, can play a part in that. I think it just has to be part of uh, your psyche and you can make it as the part of the club psyche if you're leading the club. Uh, you know, I think that's a kind of a good mindset to have uh, for, for members of a club uh, to you know, kind of make it as uh, you know, one of your mission statements, if you will, is, is how do we, um, you know, invest in our own future what do we need to do and every country like i said has a different set of issues and and you just need to know and and have creative ways uh, of addressing those issues thank you so much peter do you have any other comments Yes. Um, uh, Actually, I'll, we... I'll say one more comment, Mina. Uh, I, I, I'll make one more comment. I had a thought earlier about this, which is, you know, for, for people who are on this call, who, who are listening later, if you're from a smaller club in a smaller country, uh, I think it's good to be mindful um, of, you know, when you're doing events with speakers is, you know, how do you also make sure that the speakers come back to you? Uh, meaning, how do you put up a good audience? You know, you don't want to have to launch an event with someone very important coming into your speaker and then have five people show up because you're in a, you have a small community. So I think you kind of need to think ahead of time. How do I make it successful? How do I really attract an audience? If not Columbia community, do I need to widen out to six, seven schools? Uh, you really need to kind of <laughs> make sure you, you, you cover your, your basis. Uh, to make sure it's successful because it matters to the people who are contributing time to the club and to the other members. Because sometimes I think we, we think uh, uh, we cannot afford to think about just Colombia in a small uh, environment like Vietnam. You know, we have to really widen out the net so that we can get a, a bigger turnout because our members appreciate the relationships that you can bring to the table uh, when you launch these events, that they can meet people from Harvard, from UPenn, from Princeton, and so on and so forth. So it's part of our duty to make sure that, yeah, people have a good time, people learn, the speakers get something out of it, that you create a win-win situation for everyone involved. Thank you. We do have a hand raised, um, Daniel in the windy city of Chicago coming to us. Daniel, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes, I'd like, to, I'd like to raise this question of of the distinctions and behaviors that we have to exhibit when we have events that include um, other Ivy League schools or perhaps uh, other schools in general. And my question concerns this notion of dilution, uh, dilution of the intention um, of the camaraderie and the um, uh, celebration of all of the the spirit of Columbia in the alumni organization and how we preserve that when we have a let's just call it in quotes diluted event uh, with with uh, representation from other schools 
Um, is there a balance that we have to achieve when we think about the strategies, the objectives of such, um, let's say, pan Ivy League events, things, uh, behaviors that perhaps that we have to exhibit in the events that are different from those um, when we have just purely Columbia events? I'm going to raise that just to the general audience because it's a question I've been ruminating over for a while. Thank you, Daniel. That was a great question. I think it's, we have a few uh, folks on this call that do a lot of events with, and, and Daniel, you're talking about like Ivy, our, our other Ivy League schools as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so one example is that we have the Ivy Plus uh, here in Chicago and um, and so, so the, you, uh, Columbia has a pretty good representation at those events, um, but I have to think about what's my intention here going into an all Ivy League event. Am I going to seek out just the Columbia people and try to ensure that they're coming to my next event? Is that my only intention? Or is it to perhaps in, uh, think about the possibility of jointly marketing event to, with another school to increase or boost my turnout? Um, or just to increase the sense of community among people who have had similar educational experiences. So, so the question that is, is what do we, how do we set our intention um, for an events that are marketed uh, that are with, with other schools present? And how are those intentions different than those in which we are 100% uh, Columbia? Any thoughts with our Peter or Ivan on that yeah. in particular? Look, um, I mean, I... go for it, Peter. I don't, I, I, I had, go like ahead, a, I have a comment. You first. A, um, Laku partners, no, go ahead, with, Ivan. Laku partners with a, um, uh, an alumni organization for Latinos that also, you know, it's a pan Ivy kind of organization. Um, they tend to be a bit more professional. Um, I guess Laku is lucky enough to be able to kind of throw events on their own. Um, and then we just kind of, at, we were kind of invited to these kind of in a more professional setting, um, but they kind of end up being more like professional networking events. Um, so I, I definitely, it, it, it definitely kind of dilutes a little bit because, you know, you're not able to kind of push Columbia like you would at a normal Columbia event. Um, but I obviously completely understand if, you know, if one is in, for example, Vietnam, that, you know, maybe there's not as many alumni. It, it, if you're trying to throw a proper, you know, big event with a big speaker, then, you know, obviously it's great to have other schools. So I guess I, guess I, I tend to not at those type of things, it's, it ends up being more a little bit professional networking rather than like, let's all like celebrate our Columbia, shared Columbia experience. Yeah, I would agree with Ivan, Daniel. Uh, and, and I don't have a whole lot of experience in, in this in terms of from an organizational standpoint, but I, I would make an observation, which is, I think it depends on the type of event. Uh, if I were to throw a charity event, in any country, I would make it as big as possible and raise as much money as possible. <laughs> you know, uh, if, if, if it's a networking event, uh, depends if they just want to network within the Com Columbia community or the wider community. So I think the stated purpose is important. You need to know your objectives. Um, I, I think there are some events that should be small and cozy. Uh, and, and not go beyond uh, the Columbia community. I think people sometimes don't like that when you do dilute the event. So I think you really need to know um, the, the state of purpose and the audience. Um, so I think like there are some, for example, you know, uh, you're celebrating a certain holiday season and uh, you wanna make it cozy and everybody knows everybody. I think that's not an event you wanna dilute. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I think it comes down to uh, knowing your purpose and knowing your customer effectively. 
Thank you so much. And I, I would also add that um, a lot of times I, from experience, I know smaller clubs will use that as a tool to, uh, to help put on events. But one thing that's come out of Kale and learning from all the clubs is how uh, smaller clubs can help each other within the alumni community, especially with our virtual world we're living in now where um, SoCal and NorCal can, can partner together for an event for it with a, the same speaker. Um, I believe this Wednesday, our Philadelphia Club, Boston Club, and DC Club will, will be sharing uh, an event. Um, so I think uh, that's where I see our uh, tools, Zoom tools, and in, in, in this virtual world helping our smaller clubs still um, be able to keep that Columbia spirit, but um, but do it within the own, our own system, within the CA system. Um, we're coming to the close of our hour. Um, I, I want to circle back and, and thank Peter and Ivan again for your, uh, your thoughts and the, and the gifts that you've uh, given all of us during this, this hour. We really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank Roberto for, for the wonderful introduction. Um, any final thoughts, uh, gentlemen, before we close out the program? <laughs> I had a couple things come to me. Um, final thing um, for Jose, I, I feel having an, icon an, uh, an iconic yearly event is very important. So like who has a regreso now that um, uh, the Harvard Latinos also have a um, kind of a yearly gala. So that uh, is a kind of an event for everyone uh, to get everyone in the same roof under the same roof and kind of have one like nice iconic event um, so that maybe not just for certain demographics, but everyone together. And that was kind of my, my final thought. Thank you so much uh, everyone for joining. Um, we, this is our final week. So we hope that you will join us for some of the programs. Uh, that will be happening this week and especially on Saturday. Um, but one of the things we uh, want to promote, because if you were all in New York, we would be able to share a, a, a drink after one of the events and, and meet is there's going to be uh, several trivia nights. The first one will be uh, hosted in Singapore. Uh, so we hope you can join us and have a little fun um, to, to end your kale experience. But I uh, just want to thank everyone for, for joining and uh, please have a good evening or a good start to your day. Thank you so much. Good night. Hi guys. Thank you.